Hi, and good, welcome to this week's edition of to the Taming the Pol Polar Bears broadcast. Um, today's topic is the uh, one that's probably on most people's minds. Um, you know, as I've said many times before in the blog, if you're coming across this blog, if you're reading here, if you're viewing this or, or if you um, the other videos that I've put up, you know, there's a good chance, very good chance that you have some sort of mental health problem or, or have a loved one that does or, or someone in the family, a friend, um, and in some way a mental health problem is affecting your life. And um, you know, there, there's all kinds of mental health problems. I'm going to get to a, a number of those later. Uh, but there's, there's no question that today's topic, depression, is the number one uh, mental health problem. Now, uh, depression, um, as, as those of you who are familiar with me, with, uh, uh, familiar with me uh, no one or few people take depression as seriously as I do. You know, from being personally affected, seeing so many people affected, and then since having gotten into the polar bears and all the research I do, and the, um, you know, by now, you know, literally hundreds of people whose stories I've gotten to know or heard or worked with personally or, or followed personally. Um, you know, we, we know what kind of misery this is. We, we know how it can affect lives. We know how it can threaten to end lives and actually end lives. Um, uh, who the World Health Organization considers now considers depression the number four health problem in the world so um you know the odds are, are very very high that that you're going to be affected by depression at some point in your life or somebody very close to you will regardless of where you live in the world um, now, we, we know it's crippling, or can be crippling, it can be mentally crippling, it can be physically crippling, uh, it can be life-changing, life-altering. It, it can, um, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have, have experienced this, it, it will grind your life to a halt. Um, or, or could it, it's not necessarily but but for many of us that's that's what's happened or could happen uh, we are talking relentless inner misery um, it, it seems inescapable and it is isolating it is um, you know many of you know but I, I just cannot emphasize what we're talking about here um, so, uh, now, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get into the semantics in a minute. The semantics of depression is, is, is very interesting, and, and we're, we're just going to have a, a very preliminary look into, um, you know, the, this whole big thing called depression, because it, it's, uh, it can be a very different thing for very many different people. There are some commonalities, there are all kinds of theories, some causes and this and that. I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. Um, but I, I want you to understand um, that there is a very, you know, this word depression covers a wide, wide, wide variety of personal um, what I call subjective experiences, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further on. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do, um, you know, one, one of the problems I found with depression is, is because most people experience it, most people frame their idea, and this is very natural, this is what almost everybody will do, is frame their concept of depression through their own personal experience. And um, there, there, there are some problems with that because uh, as you'll see as we go along. So, um, so I really want to ask you to try set aside your own personal experience, um, your own uh, subjective inner experience. I'd, I'd really like to 
uh, uh, I'd really like you to set aside what you've learned in the past. Um, and I, I, you know, it's, it's what I try to do with all the polar bears things is, is posts and all that of things is really ask you to, to open your mind to uh, a different understanding. That, that's why I'm here. That's why we're here. Um, the whole point of the polar bears and, and everything I've done for the, four, the last four years is, is about um, uh, creating a, a, a new, better, deeper understanding of, of these experiences that we have of, of, <laughs> that have fall under the, the mental health, uh, the mental illness umbrella. Okay? So, so um, and I, I've used the teacup analogy before. Um, you know, this is a fresh cup of tea. And, and the analogy is to, to open your mind, clear your mind, to accept something new and fresh. So, so we're going to take our little teacup, or we're going to empty, empty our teacup, so we have a nice empty uh, teacup cup for tea. And, and I'm going to fill that up with some fresh, fresh uh, tea that's a little different than what you've ever had. Okay, so, so a new understanding. Um, now, I, I, you know, as those of you who are familiar with my story, um, those who are new four years ago, a little over four years ago, the dawn of 2013, I was coming off um, a very long, horrific uh, stretch of psychiatric difficulties, um, which, which touched just about everything in the spectrum. But but among those, it, it was suffering depression. And, and my my particular ball of wax is, is in, in the bipolar kind of spectrum of things and a big part of that is, is depression. I'm, I'm not going to talk about bipolar depression today but I, I will in the future. Um, uh, and, and what I found was um, not through personal, just personal experience but an enormous, enormous, enormous amount of research um, was that the commonly held understanding of depression it is based on the uh, psychiatric profession, the American Psychiatric Association, and, and their definitions as presented in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh, the chemical imbalance theory, I'll, I'll, get, I'll talk about neurochemicals in a bit, bit and what that means. And, and the, the treatment protocol of um, antidepressants. Um, now it turns out that's only a very small part of the picture. It turns out that doesn't really match up with what's becoming um, discovered in, in recent neuroscience and, and other many other factors. Um, so I began four years ago really questioning this, this so-called disease model and, and chemical imbalance theory model. So, uh, and that's, you know, just because of the power of the pharmaceutical industries and, 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 you know, you go see a psychiatrist, that's just odds on favorite, what they're going to explain to you. That's what you're probably gonna come across if you look into various websites and so on that, that try to explain depression that that's changing lately I see much to my delight um, okay so so we have the, the chemical imbalance theory disease model we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later um, now uh, you know I, I think I'll just move straight forward into the semantics um, you know one, one of the things that used to drive me crazy and I'm sure it does for many of you as well. It's just, you know, the very meaning of this word depression. It's just, a, 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 in my view, here comes Mrs. Bean, um, in my view, a, a tragically inadequate word for this broad, broad spectrum of human experience that we, we tend to call depression. There's, uh, uh, an, an enormous variety in, in the experience, what it means to an individual's life, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm going to get into the, the, once we look at symptoms, and, and I'll, I'll get into more of how the scale works. But it's really important to understand 
you know, where, where the, the bottom end of the scale is and the high end of the scale and what kind of factors and symptoms and so on are involved from the low end to the high end. Um, you know, we, we, we see people at the high end getting treated and, and approached and, and, you know, having everybody giving them advice as if they're on the low end. So that's kind of a tragic misdiagnosis of sorts. Then we have people who, you know, you look and dig into them, they're, they're actually not that bad, but they're being treated like they're at the high end. So there's, there's a lot of problems here, and I'll get into diagnosis. This all ties into diagnosis and things. Um, but I, it, it's, it's just really important to understand that there's a wide, wide variety. Um, and as I've kind of tried to explain before, I did this a little bit with bipolar, um, there, there's going to be some things going on that create a kind of a depressive experience. And, and you know, that's this layer. And that's going to layer on top of, you know, your base, who you are. And, you know, I talk a lot about individual differences. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, you know, so we have this kind of murky, hard to define thing we call depression. We have an enormous amount of personal variety and, and they're layered, you know, kind of layered on top of each other. You know, as I explained before, like, it, it's like your life is kind of being filtered through this, you know, with me, it's bipolar. With other people, it's depression. It might be anxiety. But, you know, there's this you, and then there's this whatever, this thing. And, and so, you know, this is, you know, why, why diagnosis and treatment is, is really difficult. But it, it bring, coming back to semantics, that's why there, there's a really, really wide variety of spectrum that falls under this general umbrella that we think of as depression, okay? So, um, so what that means is, you know, your, your experience, and, and I'll explain subjective experience in a minute, your, your experience of depression is, is just that, it's your subjective experience, and it doesn't necessarily translate to others, okay? Uh, this is a huge factor, motivating factor in all my polar bears work and research and stuff. Um, you know, we, we need to get out of these little small subjective definitions of what this is and, and get a much broader, deeper understanding. And that is precisely what this podcast today is about, folks. Okay, so moving on. Um, so we understand we need a new, new uh, understanding um, now, <laughs> you know, if you're familiar with the blog, I, I have like a hundred or more posts on there. Um, you know, some, some of them are, you know, I put them there for a reason. It's, um, so a lot of, some of the things I'm going to reference today that are on my blog, um, so you, you can go there for further information. Um, Neuroscience 101, um, <laughs> regular readers will, will know, uh, you know, we're not going to understand this, all this stuff if, if we don't understand, you know, the basic anatomy and, and how this thing works. That's a little bit of neuroscience 101. It's not that hard. You just go in there. It's okay. You'll be fine. Just don't get freaked out. Just go and poke through there and you'll be okay. I, I, I talk a lot about reality. Um, you know, it's a very, it sounds like a big philosophical thing, and it is, but I view reality as, as what we're experiencing in our minds, coming back to our subjective experience. And um, what I really firmly believe is, is when we're in a real bad depressive episode, uh, our whole concept of reality, how we see the world, how we filter the world, how we experience the world in our minds has been altered. And, um, and I, 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 I'm going to talk about this separately in, when, when I talk about reality. Uh, and I, you know, I think you'll see what I mean. But, it, but if you think about it, if you think about a depressive episode and, and how you normally are, it, it really is like a different reality. 
So that, that's why I talk about reality. So there, there's a post on reality. It'd be nice if you could go read that someday and brush up on that a little bit. Uh, neuroplasticity, um, uh, you know, all of you know, if you follow me regularly and if you don't, you, you have to get up to speed on this. Again, there's a post on this and, um, you know, this, this is a, uh, an audiovisual broadcast. I'm, I'm going to put up a post on the blog that kind of summarizes, pulls together everything I'm talking about today. So if you don't catch this right now, that's okay. Uh, neuroplasticity, the, the the ability of the brain to change its little circuits, it's, it's it, all the little minor functions and workings in there, the, the, those things are changeable. They're not set. So, you know, if your reality right now is depression, it, it doesn't have to be. The, the things that create that reality, that experience of depression, they can change. Not easily, but they can change, okay? So, so near, my, my posts on neuroplasticity come into this stress. Um, I, I could go on for four billion years about stress. Obviously, we can't do that today, but this, uh, this is another thing where you have to completely empty your mind of any previous understanding that you have of the concept of stress. And I, I have an introductory post on that. Um, there's, a, there's a post on genetic and environmental factors. That is very important. I'll, I'll touch on that again a little bit later. And um, there is some other posts. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of the other posts as we go through the symptoms and, and pull them together. But um, I, I, I just want you to know if, if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about or referencing in this talk today, um, there, there's posts on the blog that address a lot of these things or, or introduce the concepts. Okay, so let's uh, jump to it. I'm, I'm going to have my, my throat's drying out already. Uh, let, let's jump to this. Um, now, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have all this fancy equipment. I, I, I don't, uh, as yet, you know, what I'd love to have is, is uh, cards come up on the screen, so you're looking at those and not me. I'm not there yet. I'm just a poor pauper. Anyway, this is this is the best next best thing I could come up with. So, this is this is uh, <laughs> the album, the, the the Pink Floyd album, The Wall. It makes a handy little clipboard thing. Okay, so symptoms. Um, some of these uh, you you will be painfully aware of. Some of these will be kind of newish. Um, you know, again, like like back to the concept of, of depression itself. I, I, I kind of. I want to talk about all these symptoms and, and different possible meanings. And I kind of, you know, I, I know you understand, you know, if I talk about grief, you know, <laughs> I don't need to introduce that. You, you know all about grief. But we're going to look at these things in, in a little different way. You know, if we can't look at them in a different way, it's going to be harder to get past them all. Okay, so so anyways, here we go. Now, now for reasons I can't explain, this is a mirror image to me, so what I'm looking at looks kind of weird. Uh, but anyways, we have grief. Uh, we all know about grief. This is, um, you know, back, back to the semantics of depression. Um, you know, depression often happens when we lose somebody or, or something that's important to us. Uh, the, the two biggies are... are somebody we love. Um, now, in the romantic sense, you know, we have a breakup and things, you know, we get depressed about that, we feel grief. Um, this is, um, this, this is, you know, when we're talking about disease and disease model and chemical imbalances and stuff, grief has nothing to do with chemical imbalances or disease or anything. Uh, the, the grief is, is being human. If you don't feel grief, you know, you should be in the hospital for a different reason. <laughs> okay, so so grief, it's miserable, it's horrible, it's hard, but it's part of the human condition. And, and that's going to come following a, a romantic breakup, the, the death of a loved one, um, the loss of a job, uh, you know, maybe uh, the loss of our home, you know, our home burns down. Something, uh, you know, could be like a natural tragedy like that. This is going to be a very powerful, uh, impactful loss. 
and it is 100% natural to feel grief about this or, or about whatever, but when, and you know, grief has its own way of running its course, you guys know that. Um, but in, when, when we start talking about depression that doesn't go away, for some reason, this, this grief thing isn't going away. Um, you know, we, we can look at just, you know, kind of laid out these symptoms from most common to, to getting towards the more serious end of things. Uh, grief is always going to be present. And um, when, when I talk about the psychology of depression, psychological pain and so on, uh, this, this is going to be a huge factor, okay? Um, now also going to be present is, is guilt, rumination. Um, now, you know, I have, I have lots of my own personal experience of, of depression. And, um, and, and like I say, I've, I've, I've talked to dozens and hundreds of people now. And, um, it, you know, it, guilt is not always present, but in a, <laughs> this has been, uh, in a great number of court, uh, cases will just be this overwhelming, self-pummeling sense of guilt. Um, you know, I, I've seen cases, I've talked to people, um, I, I really believe guilt is the core of their, their, um, their whole experience of depression. And, and again, I'll, I'll tie that into um, the psychological causes which become physiological. Uh, but you're, you're going to see this a lot, just guilt. It, it might be about something you did to others. It might be something you think you screwed up in your life. Uh, there, there's again, this is, you know, when we come back to individual differences in individual personalities and, and life circumstances, this will vary quite a bit. Um, so the, the details will vary, but the, the experience of guilt is, is, is crushing, inescapable, um, just really, really a part of a difficult part of the mix. Uh, along with guilt will, will be the rumination. It's like, you know, rumination, and I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the neuro anatomy of some of these things later. Um, you know, rumination, we just go over and over and over again what happened. Oh my God, if I'd only just done this, if only this didn't happen, and what if, and what if, and if only. And, and this can be just a loop we get stuck on and it's really, really hard to get off that loop. So, so this, this is almost invariably a, a symptom of, of depression or a depressed state of mind. Um, distorted thinking and perspective, um, distorted thinking. Uh, anyone familiar with my blog knows how I feel about thoughts, the power of thoughts and what these are going to do to you, your mind, and, and your, your perspective. Uh, and perspective kind of comes back and ties in with, with reality. It just, it, it, it changes, it literally changes how we see and experience the world. And uh, when we're talking about cases of depression, um, you know, and, and you know, just about everybody is going to go through a period of depression. I mean, everybody experiences heartbreak, loss of some kind, you know, all these things. We get depressed. Most people go through, you know, could be a day, could be two days, a week, maybe a month. And then they come out the other side, life straightens out, they straighten out, and, and it, it, it passes. Um, but, you know, when I'm talk more what I'm talking about, and, and what if you're here, what you're probably experiencing is, is, is not that kind of depression. This comes back to the semantics and, and what this you know, word means. So, you know, these things are going to literally alter how we perceive the world, perceive what's happening to us in, in a distorted way. And, um, but when it's your reality, it doesn't feel distorted. This, this is the weird psychological factor that's really hard to entangle in a lot of people here. Um, okay. 
So distorted thinking, distorted perspectives, what I sometimes refer to as altered realities, uh, dark thoughts ties into here. Let's get this up a little bit. Uh, dark thoughts, um, you know, we, we could also call them negative thoughts, just, just very uh, dark, um, you know, science, you know, I, I read all these, these, you know, I spend a lot of time in science, as you know, um, but I also spend a lot of time reading literature, poetry. I, I have, you know, I, as you, many of you know, I, I do a lot of my, my research and learning just following various people online. Uh, I know some very good poets and writers uh, that, that can express these things well. And, um, you know, dark thoughts is one of those things that science, uh, they, they have no clue. You, you guys understand what I'm talking about. It's just, uh, you know, some, some guy in a lab coat with, with, you know, beakers and stuff. And he's got his little rat experiments there. They, 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 they don't understand this whole dark thought business. And, and if you go in and talk to your psychiatrist, psychologist, that it, it, it's highly unlikely they really understand this dark thought stuff. They, they you know, they, they understand it in an abstract term, you know, they, they come across it in school or something. But, um, but you, you, you guys probably know what I'm talking about with dark thoughts. There might be an evil aspect to them. There might be an enormous amount of rage and anger. And, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to these to the more outside observable symptoms. But um, so we know dark thoughts is going to be a big part of our inner world when we're in a deep, well, deep, dark depression. Okay, sensory changes. Um, Depression, lots of um, cool neuroscience on this. I love talking about this stuff, not today, but it is going to alter uh, folks and, and coming back to reality that, you know, the, the, you know, how strong and real all this feels. Uh, a depressive episode or a long depressive episode will, will alter our, our, our sensory equipment, how we hear, like literally change how we hear, it'll change how we smell. We, we might have trouble smelling things we used to smell. We might smell things more strongly than we did before. Um, we, we, our, 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 our tactile senses, how we sense heat, cold, all these things can be hypersensitized uh, and, and altered. You know, things that aren't irritating before become irritating. You know, just, you know what I'm talking about, like some little sound, you know, it's to another observer, it seems like nothing to you. It seems like somebody's got a foghorn in your, in your ear. So, so we're going to have lots of sensory changes. So this, this is going to be, it could be part of the soup, not necessarily, but could be. Um, intense introspection, this, this kind of ties back to this guilt and rumination. Um, now, now, one of the things I've discovered, you know, again, a little bit through my own experience, not so much so, but with a lot of cases I talk to, this, this introspection, and, and I've, I've come across some really interesting perspectives and thoughts on this in the neuroscience world and, and how this works in the brain. Um, let me just put this down for a sec. Uh, but this introspection, it, it, we, we get narrow and narrow and narrower into our own bubble world, our own selves. You know, all our, all our perceptions are being turned inward. And, you know, again, this comes back to this rumination. And, um, and, and I'll, I'll talk about, you know, how right or wrong or bad or, you know, whatever all this stuff is a, a, a little later. But, uh, but it, you, you'll just see this with people. And it, it's, makes a lot of cases really hard and frustrating to to work with. And I, I have a whole new respect and perspective of, of the people charged with, with taking care of those with severe depression. Um, and, and a big part of the problem will be this introspection, this, this kind of inner bubble world, bubble world that we can become just more and more and more narrowed down to. And, and this is a really hard thing to break. 
it, uh, but it, it, it will, uh, if you look at the harder long-term cases of depression, the, the so-called treatment resistant cases, this, this inner, this introspective, this intense introspection will, will be a big part of that. Um, sleep disruption, um, you know, this is a no-brainer. Everybody knows about this, but I have entirely different ways of looking at, at this. I'm working on a, a new post about sleep and how that ties into it. Uh, th this is a real chicken or the egg thing. Um, you know, it might be a, a, a downstream symptom of depression. You know, you're, you're normally a good sleeper. Something happens, you get depressed, you go through all the, there's going to be physiological, all kinds of things going on in your body. Um, and, and then you can't sleep. So that, that'll be, like I say, a down, downstream sign or symptom of depression. Um, or the depression, the, the kind of depressive episode feeling, you know, this weird kind of vague thing we can get going on in our heads sometimes could be as a result of uh, sleep disruption. Uh, you know, your life's going along fine, uh, all of a sudden some weird thing for some reason, and, and you know, a lot of people in, in this whole psychology, mental health biz tie anxiety and depression very closely together, and I'm, I'm in quite a bit of agreement there. In, in many cases, you know, some, we, we get anxious about something, worried about something. Uh, you know, again, it's come, come back to job loss. Maybe we don't suffer the grief and stuff about the job loss, but all of a sudden we don't have, you know, where, where's the rent going to come from? How am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to put the kids through school? So this stuff starts to go through our head. This leads to anxiety. We're lying in bed at night, can't turn this thing off. We got all these worrisome, anxious thoughts. We got sleep disruption. Um, sleep, the, the whole science of sleep and what it's, how necessary it is to our normal function is another thing I could go on, <laughs> go on about for a billion years. Um, it, it, sleep disruption will screw you up. It will cause something. All kinds of things. I, I've seen it. I've experienced it. Uh, I, I'm extremely familiar with this. Um, so depression could be something that results from sleep depression, or it could be a downstream symptom. Or often it just, you know, it starts a little here. This gets worse. The sleep gets worse. The mental experience gets worse. The mental experience gets worse. The sleep gets worse, and on and on. Okay. So so sleep is is almost invariably a part of the picture. Uh, fatigue. Um, now, th this, this is probably the most, for a lot of people, and again, I'm, I'm going by following, you know, what people post online, their experiences and, and so on. Um, you know, you, you even, you know, people make some really excellent little comic strips about the experience of, of fatigue and different things. And, uh, and, and this is another thing because fatigue is such a huge part of bipolar depression. I put an enormous amount of research into this. Um, you know, we will get fatigued. Uh, we will need to sleep more. This is kind of the opposite end of the scale of the sleep disruption. Like the sleep disruption can be not enough sleep or it could be needing more sleep than usual or, or sleeping at odd times of the day like just you know not being able to get up in the morning when when usually you're okay with that or uh you know needing to sleep you know day sometimes and and that fatigue people is absolutely real it is not a part of your imagination if somebody is kicking your ass and nagging you get out of bed Get over it. Don't be such a boohoo wimp. Send them to me, and I will kick their ass from here till eternity. The fatigue is an absolutely real physical thing. You are not being a wimp. You're not being a baby. You're not being lazy. The fatigue is absolutely real. I've got a long three-part back to blog posts. I've got a long three-part series on, on one of the possible factors. I, I think it's uh, for many people, it may be the factor in their experience of depression. Uh, and I talk about mitochondria there. I'll get into that when we look at factors, okay? But I, I really want you to understand, you know, this fatigue part 
uh, it, it is very, very real. I, I think you get the point. Okay, next, uh, body aches. Um, we, we will, this, this is a commonly kind of referred to symptom. You know, you can go to the doctor's office and they'll have a little poster up there, you know, signs of depression, blah, blah, blah. And, and one of them will be, be body aches. Um, I, I thought this was kind of a weird one. Um, turns out not not weird. Lots of very interesting body and brain physiology going on there. Um, I, I have, um, you know, I want to say they're my own ideas. They're not. They're well founded in, in some of the research. Um, but uh, I, I have. There, there are some really interesting ways. Uh, and, and again, not you know, this is not your imagination. <laughs> You're not imagining an achy body. Um, so, so body aches is going to be part of that, um, a, a, a possible part of the experience for many people, not all. Um, like again, all these things are not necessarily so for one individual. There's going to be a lot of variety among all these things, and not all of these things will be present in any one case. And, and while I'm on, on that thought, uh, I, I meant to give a little bit of a caveat and a warning before we started. I have to tell you people, thou shalt not listen to all these symptoms and start reading them into your own, uh, your own case. Uh, please be careful about that. There, there is uh, some interesting psychology on that that I need to talk to in a whole different thing. Okay, so so down at the bottom here, it, it says loss of general, and then and then I see the printer clipped off, um, but that is loss of general motivation and will. Um, um, you know you you <laughs> you know you're depressed. <laughs> you got all these things going on. Um, you know, there, there's a very real chance that, that you, you're going to become very demotivated, lose will to do things at the far end of the scale. We, of course, have lose the will to live. Um, you know, that this is another thing. Uh, you know, you, you attempt to talk about these things with people or people observe this in you and then they somehow think, oh, you're just not motivated. You need your ass kicked. You know, like, come on, get over it. Get out of bed. Um, and, and as you know, this this will want, make you want to drive red hot pokers through people's eyes. Um, you know, again, this is not your imagination. This is not something you just... There's malingerers and, and people who make excuses to get out of work and stuff, uh, you know, but it, 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 the vast, 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 vast majority of cases when we're looking at all these symptoms of, of, of depression and, and, you know, a larger medical, clinical, scientific understanding of depression, loss of motivation and will it, it is not something you just create in your imagination. There, there is a real, very real physiology to, to these, you know, what we experience is a loss of motivation. I'll get into that a little later when we talk about the possible factors and get into some of the blah, blah science stuff. Um, okay, let's, oops. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Okay, now we are getting into the higher end of the scale. Um, now, again, we're not talking a, a couple of months. We're not, well, well. some of these things will be present in short-term depression. Um, but some of these, these, these uh, symptoms I'm going to introduce here are, are more at the high end of the, you know, what is known as major depressive disorder. The more serious, is, serious cases of, of clinical depression, clinical depression is a term I used to somewhat scoff at, um, and it is, you know, quite misunderstood and misapplied through various fields and, and peoples involved in psychiatry and psychology. But, um, you know, after all the research I've done, um, you know, it might be a little bit of a fuzzy term, this clinical depression, but it is something that takes us from the common everyday depression that's just part of human experience that most people go through and that is, is getting into more of a serious medical problem. So when we start getting into clinical depression and 
major depressive disorder. The, these are the these things are, are starting to become the, the reason those things. You know, we we apply a, a diagnosis of clinical depression or major depressive disorders because we're, we're starting to see these things. So at the top, vegetative or cataconic states, I could write entire volumes of books on this on my own personal experience alone. Um, ties back to fatigue, motivation, uh, vegetative, cataconic states. Um, there, there is so much different um, biological things going on in your brain and body, you literally shut down. Um, you know, my, my own experience, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking days of, of just like vegetative state is just there, you know, the lights are on, nobody's home kind of thing. It, it, it's, it's awful, it's frightening, it's terrifying. Uh, if you experience this a little bit, it's going to be difficult when it stretches into hours, then days, then weeks. Um, there is something very, very difficult going on that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, back to what many of us are told and what goes on a lot with, with what we hear about depression, this is not boo-hoo, get over it. If you are experiencing uh, vegetative or cataconic states, um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, for a number of people, it's not going to be uncommon for, for brief periods, a little bit in the day. You know, your, your brain just hits overwhelm and shuts down for a little bit. That, that's somewhat normal and uh, it's very, it's a little bit frightening and disconcerting, but it may not be the sign of a major problem. It might just be a natural uh, reaction to some short-term crisis overwhelm. What, I, what I'm talking about is where it becomes, you know, almost a daily part of the person's experience. I've been there. Um, it is, uh, you know, when we're, we're talking about how awful depression can be, this is, this is top of the list. Um, if you are a go-getter, if you need to work, if you need to do these things, and this is going on and on, uh, this will become depressing in itself. It is awful. Anhedonia is a Greek expression uh, to do with pleasure. Uh, anhedonia is the, the loss, the ability to feel pleasure. A very common symptom, uh, what we think of as a symptom, uh, may not be though. <laughs> None of this is cut and dried, black and white, folks. Uh, but anhedonia, if, if uh, and, and I guess the best way to think of this is, is you know, if you were in the past when you were younger or, or your normal kind of states is, you know, you enjoy life and you, you get pleasure for certain from certain and and then something happens, you fall into this depressive state or it becomes a long ongoing thing. Uh, anhedonia will be uh, looked at quite differently if it's different from your normal personality, your normal reality. That's why I talk about those things so much. So if you lose the ability to, to feel pleasure, take pleasure in things, um, and again, there's going to be a whole scale to this, and I, I've, I've seen people in the hospital, the psychiatric hospital, talking to them. There is nothing going on. It is just zip, flat line. It is... Um, no, this is less of a problem for me. Um, lately, it's become more of a problem, but, um, you know, that's my bipolar side. I can get up and pleasurable about things. Uh, but long-term kind of steady state anhedonia is an awful experience. And again, this very experience itself becomes depressing. You know, just think about it. You know, you listen to your favorite music. You watch your favorite shows, you know, things that used to make you laugh or feel with joy and you feel nothing, that is a depressing, awful experience. So now we're getting into the real serious stuff, people, self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicidal planning, actions and attempts. This is why I take depression more seriously than almost anybody on the planet. This is what goes on in young people. This goes on too often. This becomes life-defining, life-altering. Um, this is something we 
really have to understand and deal with better. I can't get into all this. This, this, this. I, I could write an entire. I did, in fact, write an entire book on this. Um, this is not boohoo. Get over it. Come on, kick in the ass. Um, well, I can't completely say that every now and again with a person where this is just kind of a short impulse flash thing. Sometimes a, a trusted person, a parent, a grandparent, somebody close to them will give them a little kick in the ass and that'll move them past that. That can happen. Um, but again, when we have, when we start looking at all these other symptoms together, and this is a long-term thing, this is not kick in the ass, get over it, boo-hoo, come on, you little wimp. This is really, really serious stuff, and I will brook no argument against that. Okay? Um, now, again, this is a whole topic, but this is a different topic that I can't get to in detail today. But this is where we're starting to look at depression in you know this is where disease model starts to make more sense something really really difficult is going on here um, another symptom we'll see this kind of ties back to anhedonia fatigue seen this in myself and many cases that I've looked into or dealt with um, people just lose the ability to care about their appearance, themselves, their living conditions. Um, you know, again, um, you know, this, this is not laziness. This is not, come on, pick it up, get it together. Something really serious is going on here. There, there's some neuro, uh, I'll talk in a minute about neuroanatomy and different things that, you know, create, you know, our daily actions. Uh, when we lose interest in self-care and, and stop, you know, grooming and, and taking care of ourselves, dressing nicely, um, keeping our, our living spaces orderly, and you, you just see, you know, junk pile up, and, and it, 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 it can be very disturbing to see, and I, I've looked into that. Uh, this is, uh, this has affected me not as nearly as bad as some people. This is a really serious sign and symptom of this. You see this going on in a loved one and you're concerned. This is not, come on, quit being lazy, kick in the ass, get over it. Uh, something very serious is going on here, or very, very likely. Um, psychomotor retardation. Um, ties back to fatigue, um, catatonic states in these things. Um, this is um, somewhat recent to my discovery in, in, in the underpinning neuroscience and neuroanatomy and neurobiology and all that stuff to do with, again, this is the more long-term advanced cases of depression and um, this, this gets really hard to understand because some of the psychiatric um, drugs that people take could uh, one of the side effects is affecting um, the brain regions involved in our psych and our, our motor skills. Um, uh, we're, we're talking physical motor skills. Um, it also says psychomotor uh, skills, psychomotor retardation. This is where we, we start to experience the the cognitive difficulties. You know, our brains literally feel like they can't put two and two together. Uh, and, and again, this is where, um, you know, this is very, very hard for an, an outside observer to, to, to see. But when you're experiencing this, it is frightening. Uh, it becomes depressing itself. It, it causes, uh, it, will, it will be likely a cause of anxiety that will become part of a depressive case soup. Um, again, this is not boo-hoo, get over it. There are some serious neurobiology, neuroanatomy type stuff going on that's impairing our very ability to move and physically function. Again, this, this ties back to the fatigue symptoms and why we just feel, and, and the vegetative states, like it just feels we can't, you know, and it's literally our brains cannot process and create actions to what's going on around us. 
and that will tie back to um, another symptom I didn't quite list here, but it, uh, I've also um, done a great deal of research on uh, cognitive impairment, memory impairment, and things like that. Uh, and I know many of you uh, understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so um, now I think you have a better understanding of the semantics and why I can get into, go into great length about the semantics. Uh, you know, all, all these symptoms we looked at, and again, I'll, I'll try to get this all into a blog post and put it up on the blog, and you can look at it there. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a whole scale, and you know, each one of these symptoms, there's a, there's a whole scale, you know, from, you know, just beginning, a, a cons you know, maybe a concern, maybe not, to, to something really entrenched and, and difficult to turn around. And, um, and this, this is why the semantics and, and so a few things we're going to look at in a moment become so difficult. This is why people, you know, <laughs> you know, it used to drive me crazy. It still can. When, when people have some kind of experience with depression and it passes, uh, you know, they'll think they're the world's leading expert on depression and getting over it, and they, they can give advice to every anybody who's going through depression. Uh, this is something that has to stop. Um, you know, when I you, you know when I look into the complexity of all this, this is really really difficult to understand, diagnose, and create solutions for as much as all you well-meaning people out there would like to try. Okay. Possible factors. Um, uh, I'm, I'm getting a little long in the, long in time here. I, I apologize, but again, this is a lot to get to. Excuse my little Pink Floyd uh, board here again, but possible factors. Um, now, biological. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this short. Uh, biological. Uh, I'm just going to kind of narrow that down to some of the, uh, you know, back to the chemical imbalance theory and, and you know, the basis for most um, antidepressants and things. Uh, biological, we're talking uh, neurochemicals. Um, now, I've written a few blog posts on this if you want to go understand how, what neurochemicals are and what they do. This is why I write these posts and put them up there, so they're there to go look at and understand what these things are. Uh, but things like uh, serotonin is, is the one that's <laughs> almost always cited as, as a factor in depression. I, I looked at that. It's it just hopelessly, hopelessly, hopelessly simplistic when we're trying to understand all these various symptoms. Um, nonetheless, there is evidence that, you know, serotonin does play a role in how we experience things like pleasure and feeling good and stuff. Um, again, I've got a long post on serotonin. That's the place to go to start getting a better understanding of that. Uh, dopamine. Uh, dopamine, another, you know, extremely well-studied, well-understood neurotransmitter. Um, part of all, virtually all animal behavior. When, when we're talking about um, a number of factors here, um, lo loss of ability to feel pleasure, dopamine is going to be involved in that. Uh, loss of motivation, dopamine is going to be involved in that. Um, psychomotor retardation, uh, all those. Uh, brain regions and mechanisms, uh, dopamine is going to play a role in that. Uh, we have uh, neuro, uh, neuro, <laughs> shoot, I was going to screw this up, neuroperephrine, and I think I'm still mispronouncing that. Um, that's another uh, quite significant major and, and very, very basic elementary neurotransmitter present in almost all creatures from, from round worms on up. Uh, very critical to, to many of our wake sleep cycles, uh, our, our drives when we're feeling turned on and, and excited and, you know, that kid before Christmas can't sleep and can't wait to get at that. Uh, neuropreferine is going to be uh, play a role in that. If you are suffering sleeplessness, neuropreferine could be playing a role in that. I, I get into that in one of my 
uh, other neuroscience blogs. Um, other part of the biology is uh, there, there's um, a great number of possible um, uh, hormonal factors. Um, one of the, the differences in understanding the difference between male and female depression. Um, you know, when we're looking at individual differences, um, you know, this is this is the very basics of that. You know, you know, we, we, we can get into all kinds of arguments about the, the sexes, but we, you know, we, we can't argue about the different biology between men and women, different hormones going on, different levels of hormones, what regulates those hormones. Um, women have menstrual cycles. Women um, give birth. Uh, th these are all going to cause massive hormonal changes. There are many possible factors in depression that will involve something involved uh, will involve something to do with with hormones out of balance. Uh, and there is some interesting, um, uh, you know, case history uh, where. Uh, uh, hormones are, are something that can be measured uh, and, and you know our pituit pituitary glands and, and adrenal glands and things hor hormone levels are out of whack uh, do some hormonal treatment return hormonal levels to normal uh, the depressive symptoms and episode goes away so you know it, it, it is very hard to argue that there's not going to be some biology whether neurochemicals or hormones involved. Again, this is a chicken or egg thing. Did the, the, the hormones or, or the, the, the hormonal changes or neurochemical changes or uh, neurochemical pathways change and cause the depression? Or is the life experiences in something changing the biology? Chicken or the egg? Um, nobody has that figured out yet, but biological, uh, factors will, uh, in, in many, again, not all, but in many cases, play a role. Anatomical differences in the brain. This is my favorite area. Um, you know, I've talked about this in many, many posts, and, and, and this is why I write about, you know, Neuroscience 101 and all this stuff. Um, you know, whatever our you know, mental experience is that there's going to be brain regions involved in that. You know, our brain is, is, is you know, I, I call them inner, inner galaxies with, with dozens of different galaxies and planets in there. They're all interconnected, but, but certain ones play larger roles in creating, you know, different thought patterns. Um, when I go back to the symptoms, the, the, the guilt, renew, renew, rumination, guilt and rumination, distorted thinking, that kind of thing, the, there will be specific brain regions involved in creating those particular kinds of thoughts. Um, anatomical differences can be, uh, again, just the way very, and there's just way, way, way too much to get into here today, but this is why I wrote Neuroscience 101. If you go look at that, all these different brain regions and stuff, you know, major brain nodules, pieces of the, the stress response system, all these things. This is why I write and outline all these things. There will be very well could be anatomical differences in those um, that are creating the experience, you know, how we experience the world and, and thus create more pronation to, to becoming depressed or rumination, the, these, these symptoms we associate with depression, okay? So these could be uh, due to, in great part, polar in part to, to anatomical differences in the brain, comes back to how we're treated and how we're spoken to. This is not boo-hoo, get over it. Uh, you know, the, the, this is like expecting, you know, somebody with no legs, you know, to run a marathon. Um, you know, and it's possible now, but uh, you, you know what I mean. It, it, you know, we, we, we physically can't change some of these things because of anatomical differences in the brain. I talk about neuroplasticity for uh, an enormous amount of reasons that comes back to this. You know, um, that neuroplasticity works for the better or the worse. Uh, negative plasticity could be 
more and more changing our brain anatomy to create depressive mental states. Uh, but on the flip side, there are things we can do, the positive side of neuroplasticity, where we can change the, the, our very brain anatomy and networks and whatnot to change how our brains create our mental experiences. Now, coming back from, from both biological and anatomical, this comes back, this comes, boils down to genetic and environmental uh, factors. I, I wrote a long, long, detailed post on that on my blog. Again, I, you know, there's no way I can explain all this, but if you want to understand what I'm talking about, that's in my, my blog piece. Um, uh, enormous amounts of evidence now, a lot of depressive symptoms and, and pronation to depression, anxiety, and so on. And there's a hereditary genetic component to this. Um, there are people who jump up and down and, and scream and shout that this is not true, blah, 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 but it is. It is we, we might not have the precise mechanisms. It's, it's very DNA and all this is very, very complicated, but there's just too much evidence to ignore that. Uh, and environmental factors, your life circumstances, this is from everything from your life circumstances growing up, you know, where you go to, where you went to school, all kinds of things. Um, and not only that, it, your, your family circumstances, all that. But also, um, you know, I'm talking about environmental pollutants and things like that. Lead. Um, people are exposed to environmental pollutants. Or, and, and there are uh, things in the food supply. Um, they're very hard to trace and nail down absolutely definitively, but there's just too much evidence to ignore where certain, um, you know, heavy, could be heavy metals, different chemicals um, used in create different kinds of foods, food processes that could in some people alter how their brain functions. So this comes back to, to anatomical differences. Um, could be as a result of genetic and environmental conditions beyond the person's control. Um, you know, in my blog, I, I, I really try to get across, uh, get help people get past self blame and guilt. You know, coming back to the rumination and guilt thing. You know, you know, we, we, if you're going to beat yourself up about something, don't beat yourself up about this. These these are things that you didn't create. They they come from things that developed in you uh, that were, were way, way beyond your control. And, and when I say genetic, I'm, I'm going back before conception and, and possible generations ahead of your time, okay? Uh, now, um, triggers, current or past life events or circumstances uh, will absolutely um, play a role in many, many people. Uh, you know, again, a, a significant loss, uh, something that's going to have a very painful impact. Um, and there's just too wide a variety. Um, but when we, um, just, just to, to briefly state, when I, I bring this up, when, when we're trying to understand whether depression is, is something natural, this is a natural response to something really difficult in your life, um, you know, then it's not a disease. This, this is natural. Like if this is not happening, the, 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 you know, maybe there, there's something else going on. But for many cases, the depression is going to be the result of a, a very impactful life thing. It could be a major uh, health thing, a, a heart attacks, things like that have been known to, to uh, trigger massive depressive episodes, loss of a house, loss of a job, these kinds of things, okay? So it's gonna be some kind of, could possibly be some kind of current past life event, circumstance, crisis. Um, uh, stress response. Um, again, I, I just have an enormously different way of looking at, at stress and this, our whole stress response system from brain to body. Um, that's going to be tied in there somewhere, regardless. In any case, you, you give me any case of depression on earth, there, there will be something involved in the stress response. This comes back to bi biology and hormones. 
uh, neurochemical imbalances, stress response will be enormously involved in what's going on with the, the biology. Uh, GI tract, your gastrointestinal tract, uh, fantabulous recent research. This is a whole new area of research of the, the power your, your gut has over your brain. There's some terms becoming more from familiar um, from, from your stomach, all, all through your digestive system, your, 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 um, uh, um, all through your digestive system. You, you have uh, what's called a microbiome down there. Um, um, microbes, various bacteria and stuff. Uh, turns out these play an enormous role, possible role in what's going on in our head. Uh, to me, it makes a lot of sense. I don't have time to, to completely outline that all today. Uh, but there is some very, very compelling evidence that when somebody is in a depressive episode and it seems like it just came out of the blue for no reason, there is something going on in the GI tract. And there's some very interesting case studies where a doctor who just happened to be brilliant ahead of his time in understanding this changed the person's diet, got their microbiome, all these bacteria in the gut in better harmony, and the person's depressive and psychiatric symptoms went away virtually overnight. Not a common thing, uh, but a, a factor that can't be ignored. Um, energy. Um, let me take this apart here. E energy. Uh, and again, it, 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 it's just such a huge chicken or the egg thing. Um, but what, what I found when I researched how our bodies produce energy at the cellular level, um, I discovered mitochondria. Again, this is all in my blog. You can go and read it there. I'll outline it in, in a post coming up very what everything I've talked about in a post coming up soon so don't worry if you can't remember all these terms uh, mitochondria is, is what produces energy in every single movement every single thought requires mitochondria to produce energy in our brain cells our, our body cells every cell in our body and brain mitochondria will be involved um, I look at a lot of cases and I see some evidence where the person, um, you know, there, there, there's an old term and I, I don't hear it so often anymore, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I, I, I think we've moved past that just because of the understanding of it has changed since um, this originally began getting observed in the 70s and 80s, I believe. Um, but I, I have a, a quite a large theory that I haven't quite gotten to, to laying out yet, that for some people, a certain percentage of people, um, that there might be some genetic or environmental factor reason that has um, left them with impaired mitochondria, these energy engines. And if, if our mitochondria is impaired and we cannot create the energy to do, you know, physical movements, brain movement, you know, just like I said, mito, and, and this is all in the blog pieces, you know, how mitochondria is, is absolutely essential to every brain function. You know, if we look at it in that understanding and come back to many of those factors, um, sorry, those symptoms we looked at, um, there could be something going on with the, the brains, or, or, sorry, our very cells, all the cells in our brain and body, the ability to create energy might be creating these symptoms that we think of as depression. Uh, you know, so again, this is not boohoo, get over it, what's your problem, you, you loser, all these things we hear. That this is a, you know, back to the biology, possible biological factors. This energy and uh, mitochondria, I believe, uh, could be a very, very significant factor. Um, getting to the end, folks, um, you know, the human condition. Uh, 
you know, like I say, depression can be very, very serious. You understand? I take it very seriously. I don't. I don't think I have to relate that point anymore. Uh, but uh, a, a factor that upsets me in a great number of cases and with a great number of people I see and hear and observe and follow. Um, you know, this come, kind, of, kind of comes back to this, this, this bone I have to pick with the psychiatric association and the pharmaceutical industries um, and, and many in the psychology end of this whole battle agree is, you know, in many, many, ways, many, many ways, depression is just part of the human experience. It always has been. You know, like I say, I've, I've, I've looked into all this back a thousand, two thousand, you know, the, the, the dawn of, of, of literature and, and recorded time. Depression is part of the human experience. Um, you know, I look at people who don't get depressed and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you, know you guys know what I'm talking about. You're like, what the, the hell are you talking You never get depressed? Like, there's something wrong with you. Like, depression feeling grief and, and guilt and some of these things and, and this painful sense of loss is, um, you know, just part of being human. And so, um, you know, when, when like, again, this, there's, there's so much of this that's, that's chicken or the egg stuff. Um, so a lot of what might be involved in any given case of depression could well be psychological um, but psychological when, when we say psychological you know what we're talking about is our thoughts and the, these things we think of as non-physical um, but what I found and, and this is why I think the neuroscience of all this is so important is you know, we, we, you know, we don't create our thoughts, you know, they don't, they don't come from nowhere, folks. They, they, there's brain regions, individual neurons, and all kinds of things involved in creating thoughts. So, you know, there, there, there becomes this, so, so when I say psychological, uh, and, and this is where I kind of you know, part ways with the whole psychology end of things, is, you know, they're not exactly psychological is this you know some kind of you know there's no they, they're just there for no particular reason that that's not true like our thoughts and um you know when i when i talk about stress and what's going on in a stress response system and and the things that could kick off and, and cascade into all these symptoms i talked about um you know, a lot of that is quote unquote psychological. Like when, when we think of, of unidentified fears, you know, we're just feeling fearful, but we can't identify why. When we're feeling anxiety and we can't quite identify why. Um, you know, there are anatomical basis for those uh, things we're, we're perceiving in our mind. They, they just don't pop out of the air, folks. So, um, but again, like a lot of this stuff, coming back to the human condition uh, and, and what to do about the depression to get to the, the final part of this program. Um, you know, some of this is just being human, folks. As much as it sucks, as much as it hurts, as much as, you know, we hate what we're going through. Um, and, and regardless of all this neuroanatomy, neurobiological stuff, um, you know, all those things will be present. But, um, you know, we, we, we can't look at the World Health Organizations and, and you know, what I've read. I mean, I, I read literature, everything, like I say, going back thousands of years. It's, it's pretty hard to escape. But, hey, this is just part of being human. Um, and that is really important to understand when we're looking at a course of treatment. So that brings us to, folks, the $64,000 question, 64 million with interest. Uh, you know, what to do about all this? Um, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, since I started this blog, 
you know, I, I take two, <laughs> I guess this is kind of my bipolar me, um, you know, I take it very seriously that there's some really, really difficult things going on in, 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 in not any, but most cases of depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, all these things, there's absolutely some really difficult things going on. Uh, but the other side of me, uh, there, there, there's hope and ability to get past virtually all of these things. I, I've seen it uh, personally. I, I kind of doing it personally. I don't like to trumpet my own personal story, but um, but it's it's something that I uh, that um, you know that I, I, I can say with all truth has has, has happened. Now, uh, but I, I, it's not so much myself, but I, I've seen enormous, enormous, enormous amount of cases, and this is why I go on at length about neuroplasticity and change and all this stuff. There is, regardless of where you are, it is possible to change all that. And regardless how difficult your case is, it's possible to change all that. Now, precisely how, um, I, I think you can understand um, now I might, you know, again I outline, you know, all, all these things, and it look it looks like it can be very very difficult and and and, and a little bit well depressing. And, and here's Mrs. Bean, she she she's telling me it's time to go, um, you know, and and so there, there's this balance between understanding, you know, you know the factors that that you know these difficult physical, physiological, biological factors and, and life circumstance factors, you know, so that we take this seriously and, and don't just brush people off with boo-hoo, get over it. And, and balancing the seriousness of it with, with the hope and, and the belief that, you know, this, you know, again, this is why I talk about reality. This does not have to be our reality. This does not have to be our narrative. This does not have to be our future. Um, and how, sorry, how, how to get there it is going to vary from person to person. And, you know, as I think we can begin to comprehend now, there's a lot of factors involved both in the person's basic personality, life circumstances, and so on, and then what might be going on, you know, with all the neurobiology, neuroscience, blah, blah, blah stuff. And... You know, what I try to do in my blog is, is give us the broadest number of ways and concrete little steps we can take to moving, you know, understanding and, and moving forward. Um, now, you know, I, I can't, it, it, it's not correct, ethical, or right for me to offer specific advice in, in, a, in a, you know, kind of open um, forum like this where we're just kind of looking at the, the broad picture of all this um, so I you know I, I don't want to you know this this is what the blog is for this is why I write about you know the positive difference making fundamentals and and there are you know that's you know as, as enthusiastic as about as I am about those things I understand those you know aren't going to be you know what works for everybody um, you know I don't Pardon me, I don't like pharmaceutical drugs as a long-term solution, but I think for a number of people that's absolutely going to be part of the picture to begin with. Um, for a num there, there, there's a certain um, group of people, you know, psych uh, um, pharmaceutical drugs, psychiatric drugs, antidepressants, um, um, anti-anxiety drugs you know this has been their way of life you know almost all their life and and, and if you're one of those um, you know stopping that it is a, it's a long process it, it may not be advisable for a wide variety of complicated reasons um, but one way or another there is a way forward um, that's the best message I can leave you with today um, and, I, you know, what I can tell you about my own approach, and this has been for, for a number of years now, I look at all of this um, as rehab. 
you know, you, you have a devastating physical injury that is you know, like a, or a stroke uh, or, or a devastating physical injury that is, is completely changed how you can physically move about in the world. Um, you know, when I talk about the seriousness of, of a lot of these um, um, symptoms we looked at, that's exactly how I see it. You know, when I started off the program, how life altering, how life impacting, how life changing these things can be. That's how I look at it. Just like a stroke, just like a devastating physical injury. We don't just, you know, shoo those people up back out into the world and tell them, well, too many people do actually, but you can see how unreasonable that is to expect. Uh, so I look at it the same way with, with a, a, you know, virtually any case of depression. It, it's, it's um, you know, let, let's get past all the doctor diagnosis, all that stuff. If you're going through this, it doesn't, in a sense, it doesn't really matter how you got there. It does a little bit, but um, I look at it as, as a serious injury that needs to be rehabbed. And there, there's a process for that. And it, it, it's, it has to take time. Okay, so, so if you're listening and, and want something to kind of take away from all this, um, that's really how I want you to look at it. What your specific rehab would look like um, it, it is the matter of a deeper, more personal discussion. But, to, you know, we, we can rehabilitate people with strokes. We can get people from, like, really, really devastating physical injuries in, into a better life. Uh, uh, you know, they, they don't have to stay, you know, so physically impaired and, and d disabled. And so just like with that, we, we can get you to a better place. We, we don't know what that better place is it doesn't matter just better than where you are is what we're looking at okay so um now uh just to, to, before i sign off um a, a little change in my whole approach to things um after lengthy lengthy discussions with with all kinds of um, former clients I've, I've been working with many people pro bono for, for a number of years now um, and with professionals in the field that I've come to know, psychologists, people in the uh, fields of psychiatry, I've developed some very good contacts, uh, and, and a number of them are really supportive of the whole taming the polar bears approach. Um, so after enormous amounts of discussions with, with, with you know, from the client end of things and, and the professional end of things, um, I, I've been encouraged to to uh, look at more seriously taking on clients. Um, so if you are interested in that, um, just write to tamingthepolarbears@gmail.com. If you want to write there, I'll, I'll just leave this here for a minute so you can write that down. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll put this in the blog somewhere. But, uh, but if you would like personal help, if you'd like me to work with you to work through understanding all these things, understanding you, your life, uh, and how to get past this and create a better life, I'm very good at that kind of thing. So they say, um, just write to Taming the Polar Bears at gmail.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. And that is over and out for now. Bye now. Thanks for joining.